I think American schools teach too little about evolution. A lot of the information regarding evolution is taught uncritically. I don't think this is good science education for the students in that district, and apparently neither did his colleagues nor his superintendent. Our job is to teach the adopted curriculum, and that's what we follow. The controversy is about whether a science teacher can actually give students evidence that's critical of Darwin's theory of evolution. We want them to learn a religiously inspired critique of science based on faulty interpretations and non-existent facts. That the separation of church and state could crumble under mounting pressure from those... I could those not, not verbally share any of this information with my students. The role of a high school teacher is not to be on the cutting edge of research. I have never seen such intolerance in a political issue. The icons of evolution, these are examples uh, of textbook evidences that actually distort the scientific evidence. The controversy in modern times is not between science and religion, it's between two different interpretations of the same scientific evidence. Scientists are supposed to question things. Scientists are supposed to be open to new evidence. And I'm a scientist. I don't know any evidence against evolution. That's okay for a PBS special, but that's not the real world. That's not what's taking place. They won't allow a debate to go on. They try to stop it. And the reason they try to stop it is they don't think they can win it. Burlington, Washington, a quiet, peaceful community about an hour north of Seattle, an unlikely setting for a battleground, but that's exactly what it has become. On a recent night, hundreds of parents, teachers, and students gathered at the local high school because of biology teacher Roger DeHart. Already, I'm being chastised or criticized that somehow my students can't understand for 15 years, DeHart has been a popular teacher at Burlington High School. Now, he's under fire for his teaching of evolution. Based on Darwinian evolution, or based on evolution, we would say that which ones would be the fittest? I think it's Im very important for students to understand evolution. I think it's important that uh, I teach students uh, evolution and that they understand it so that they'll be successful in universities if they choose to go on. Well, I love biology. I, uh, the thing that intrigues me was just the different habitats and ecosystems and things like that. I was intrigued by that. I love being out there. And so I had a real love for biology. The more I learn about the complexity of life, genetics and the human genome and uh, the idea of this uh, information in the cell. I think it's fascinating. What is the mechanism? But How the heart's passion for change? biology is tempered by frustration. Right? Frustration that students aren't learning enough about evolution. According to the heart, teachers and textbooks are not presenting an accurate representation of evolutionary theory. Either some of the current leading research is being left out, so it's dated, or else it's just plain misrepresented. Because of his desire for students to learn accurate science, DeHart decided to supplement the standard unit on evolution with additional materials. Then someone complained. A citizens group was organized. Groups from outside the community began to lobby the school district, and the dispute became an issue in school board elections. The controversy polarized Burlington. Widely discussed trial of the 20s, the Darwin case, July 24th, 1925. Of course, this is not the first time evolution has divided a community. Back in the 1920s, Dayton, Tennessee prosecuted high school teacher John Scopes for teaching evolution to students in violation of state law. Remembered today as a classic battle 
pitting religious fundamentalists against defenders of science and academic freedom. The Scopes trial continues to affect how we view the controversy over evolution in the schools. According to defense attorneys, was the right to teach what science had found factual. But there is one important and unexpected difference between John Scopes and Roger DeHart. Scopes was a proponent of evolution. DeHart is not. And those who are trying to censor him from teaching too much about evolution are not religious fundamentalists. They are supporters of Darwin's theory. I think American schools teach too little about evolution. I think that a lot of the information regarding evolution is taught uncritically. Does natural selection provide you with more information? They're not asking students to really examine the evidence given and to ask whether or not that's a plausible explanation. It's more or less regurgitate the facts, regurgitate what we've told you. And don't question, because if you question, that means that you must have a religious belief. And uh, that must motivate your objections to, to evolution, rather than the science. Caught in the middle of that clash and the shouting match... That DeHart's situation caught the awareness of the national press setting off a frenzy of media attention. The ACLU disagreed and filed a complaint with the school. The separation of church and state could crumble under mounting pressure from those who want creationism taught as science. In the local newspaper, opponents of DeHart took out a full-page ad and filled the pages with angry letters to the editor. Fanatics like DeHart and his cohorts will never be satisfied. The issue is whether students receive the education they're legally entitled to, free of contamination by the religious agenda of DeHart. Mr. DeHart stands exposed as the fox in the hen house, from which he should be ejected. When parents discovered that their children, in their view, were not being taught science, but rather were being taught basically incorrect facts and wrong science, on the basis of what they thought was Mr. DeHart's religious motivation, they had every reason to petition their Board of Education for the redress of that grievance. Contrary to state law, Darwin's theory of evolution. When the Scopes trial took place in 1925, you had a large part of the country where school boards would not allow Darwinian evolution to be taught. I think that's hardly true anywhere, and certainly nobody wants that to be true today. What you have is the Scopes trial turned on its head now because you've got people who say uh, in school boards, you can't teach any criticism of Darwin. Often all we hear about are the creationists who are trying to stop teachers from teaching evolution. But that really is an outdated stereotype. If it ever was accurate, it certainly isn't any longer. The sort of teachers now not allowed to teach science are teachers like Roger DeHart who are being told that they can't criticize Darwin in the classroom. The Roger DeHart controversy is just typical of many in the country. What he's trying to do is show that there are serious growing uh, concerns among scientists about Darwinian evolution. The controversy in modern times is not between science and religion, it's between two different interpretations of the same scientific evidence. It's not science versus religion, it's science versus science. There's no controversy among scientists over whether evolution took place. I don't know anybody who argues against whether evolution took place, except for those who have religious reasons for it. Anytime anyone criticizes Darwin's theory of evolution, evolutionists immediately cry, it's about religion. Well, the claim that all skeptics about Darwinian uh, orthodoxy or Christian fundamentalists stands refuted by me. It's obviously not true. I'm not, neither Christian nor a fundamentalist. Um, but lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. I became skeptical of Darwinian evolution early on, outside of any religious influence, just because of the complexity that I was learning about in the cell, and we use the word elegant in um, genetics. So I removed myself. In part, evolution was a powerful explanatory mechanism, but it seemed insufficient. School officials informed DeHart that any supplemental materials he wanted to assign, even articles from mainstream science publications, now had to be submitted for approval. I know of no other teacher who actually submitted articles to the principal for review uh, up until my controversy. According to DeHart, 
His principal rejected all his requests, and he was forbidden from using any outside materials that might be critical of evolution. They went from not allowing me to introduce any supplemental materials, then to telling me that I could not verbally share any of this information with my students. The fact of the matter is, every other teacher in Burlington School District was allowed to assign supplementary materials whenever they want. But when Roger DeHart decided to assign a few articles from mainstream science journals, they censored him. One article Roger DeHart wanted to show students was from the American Biology Teacher, the leading peer-reviewed journal for secondary school biology teachers. It was written by Jonathan Wells, a biologist with a Ph.D. in molecular and cell biology from the University of California at Berkeley. Wells is one of a growing number of scientists raising objections to Darwin's theory. In his article, Wells points out how many textbooks continue to use fraudulent drawings of embryos made by 19th century German Darwinist Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel was a, a German biologist and artist, a contemporary of uh, Darwin's, who, uh, among other things, made some famous drawings of vertebrate embryos, uh, fish, humans, salamanders, chicks, turtles, and so on. And in those drawings, Haeckel tried to show that all these different vertebrates look very much the same as early embryos. Their early similarities showed that they came from a common ancestor, and differences arose only later. The problem is that he faked his drawings. The early vertebrate embryos don't really look that similar at all. The problem with Haeckel's drawings wasn't just that they were inaccurate. They were actually false in many cases. Uh, but the real damage was done when these drawings entered into biology textbooks decades ago, and they've never really been taken out. If you open a high school biology text now, or even a college biology text, you'll find these drawings, although they may not refer to them as Haeckel's drawings, and in fact, they trace their ancestry directly to Haeckel. You see the pictures of the embryos. And it's what really kind of damaged our understanding of, of development and our understanding of biology in general. It's clear that, that Haeckel may have fudged his drawings somewhat to look more like his ideal than they actually are. Now, does that actually take away from what we know about the relationship of embryology to evolution? Not a bit. The whole Heckel's embryo story has been greatly blown out of significance. Uh, it is a minor footnote in the history of science. And actually, it's been known for 10 or 15 years that Heckel's embryos are not to be relied upon. The reason why the diagrams are reproduced is because they're um, easily available. Uh, there's no copyright on them. It's a, an easy way to, uh, to illustrate a point. And I would argue that the basic point that's being illustrated by those drawings is still accurate. But if you go back earlier in development, the different classes of vertebrates look even more different. According to Wells, Haeckel, in many modern textbooks, misleads students not just because of fake drawings, but because they leave out the earliest stages of embryonic development. What students are shown as the first stage of embryonic development is actually the mid-stage. And very few textbooks show those earliest stages, and yet that's the whole point. It's the earliest stages that are supposed to be the most similar, and they're not. Some textbooks actually use photographs of embryos, but they pick only that stage and those classes that happen to look most similar. And they omit the earlier stages and they omit those classes that don't look similar. So that to me is uh, picking the evidence very carefully to support the theory, and that's not good science. Wills is a critic of Darwin's theory, but even staunch evolutionists like Harvard's Stephen Jay Gould have criticized the use of diagrams based on Hegel in textbooks. Stephen Jay Gould wrote an article for Natural History saying that we need to let go of this, of these drawings, that uh, basically that they're not needed. But when DeHart requested permission to let students read Gould's article, that request was turned down too. Why does Mr. DeHart feel so strongly to have these articles read? Well, it's because he wants to call into question the whole issue of whether evolution happened. I don't think this is good science education for the students in that district, and apparently neither did his colleagues nor his superintendent. 
We have a science curriculum. We have a mainstream science theory called evolution. Our job is to teach the adopted curriculum, and that's what we follow. But just how important are Haeckel's embryos? And does a single textbook mistake even matter? If Haeckel's embryo drawings were the only problem with biology textbooks, I would agree that this is an isolated error. The problem is that it's not the only problem. In fact, says Wills, today's textbooks are filled with outdated examples for evolution, which many evolutionary biologists no longer consider good science. In a recent book, he calls these the icons of evolution. The icons of evolution, these are examples uh, of textbook evidences that have taken on a life of their own. They go far beyond the truth, far beyond the facts, and have become symbols, in effect, of uh, Darwin's theory. Symbols that actually distort the scientific evidence. In many cases, they're called icons by Darwinian biologists themselves. A second icon of evolution, according to biologist Jonathan Wells, are finches found on the Galapagos Islands off of South America, islands Darwin visited in 1835 on the voyage of the HMS Beagle. Another icon of evolution are uh, uh, some species of birds on the Galapagos Islands that are very similar except for the size and shape of their beaks. And it's thought, and it's quite possible, that they evolved from a common ancestor because of uh, having to eat different foods on the different islands. In 1994, journalist Jonathan Weiner published The Beak of the Finch, a book about research into the Galapagos finches. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Weiner argued that the finches represent the best and most detailed demonstration to date of the power of Darwin's process. Similar claims are made in many biology textbooks. The Galapagos finches are a spectacular example of evolution. When the food quality, in other words, the kind of food that was available changed as a result of a drought or a particularly rainy year or something like that, over the course of just a couple of years, they could see dramatic changes in the beak sizes in various populations. Natural selection can drive changes of a structure, like the beak, in one direction in response to selective pressure, not just fast enough to account for what would be required for Darwin's theories, but actually 50 to 100 times faster than that. A severe drought could cause many of the finches to die and leave only those with larger beaks. So in the following generation, the average beak size was increased. And some textbooks extrapolate this over 200 years or so and say that a few of these events strung together could transform these finches into a new species by making their beaks larger. Look, the stuff about uh, finch beaks is certainly interesting. Let's, let's not confuse ourselves about that. Um, the question is, can it be extrapolated, or does it represent cyclic variation? What the books fail to mention is that as soon as the rains came back, the average beak size returned to normal. There was no net evolution. What we're really seeing is just one species oscillating back and forth with no real evolutionary change. So, the evidence is exaggerated to make it appear to support Darwin's theory in a way that it really doesn't. The contrary may be true. We may be seeing the development of entirely new species. The Galapagos finch starts off as a finch, and uh, within 100 million years, there'll be a Galapagos elephant. Could be. But we need a whole lot more by way of evidence than a couple of uh, nutty journalists going down there looking at finch beaks and uh, writing a Pulitzer Prize winning book. A whole lot more of this is to be serious science. I mean, this doesn't even pass the threshold of anecdote. Uh, finch beaks change in size. Yeah, they do. They change in shape, too. It seems to be correlated with seasons. It seems to be a regress back toward the mean when the seasons change again. If this is the part of a spectacular evolutionary extrapolation, let's have additional reasons for thinking that. The changes are temporary. They oscillate back and forth, and they don't go anywhere. So as evidence for the origin of species, Darwin's finches uh, really don't work. 
Critics of Darwin's theory say that finch beaks provide a good example of microevolution, small changes within a species or gene pool. But it does not by itself provide evidence for macroevolution, which is the origin of fundamentally new organisms and body plans. When we look at dogs, no matter how far back we go, it's dogs. When we look at bacteria, no matter what we do, they stay bugs. They don't change in their fundamental nature. There seems to be some sort of an inherent species limitation, and we have no good explanation for this in terms of a Darwinian theory. We should have far more flexibility, far more plasticity under laboratory conditions than we actually do if Darwinian theory or anything like that were correct. According to critics of Darwin's theory, the problems facing macroevolution can be clearly seen in yet a third icon of evolution, the four-winged fruit fly. In opening a biology text, um, one will often see a picture of a four-winged fruit fly. Now, as we know, ordinary fruit flies have only two wings. The four-winged fruit fly has not only its regular set of wings, but a second set of wings just next to that. And the caption or the text will say, this is evidence for um, the process of evolution, that mutations affect the process of development and you can get anomalies as interesting as a four-winged fruit fly. Well, it turns out that the four-winged fruit fly is actually a very poor example of Darwinian evolution, certainly. There are no muscles attached to it, so the second set of wings is effectively dead. Uh, the fly is a hopeless cripple. It's kind of like having a small plane with an extra pair of wings tied to its tail. The fly can only survive in the laboratory, uh, and it would be selected out by natural selection in the wild. So it's not uh, a step forward in evolution. It's an evolutionary dead end. Modern Darwinian theory, known as Neo-Darwinism, is based on the idea that randomly occurring mutations in genes provide the raw material needed for evolution to work. The idea that mutations are considered the engines of evolution has only one problem. There's no evidence to support it. So if you think about changes in the genetic code, can you think of any changes that would be beneficial or helpful to organisms? Almost all mutations are deleterious. Almost all of them do the organism absolutely no good. In fact, we have a devilishly hard time finding any mutations that do the organism any good whatsoever. These organisms only really survive in the laboratory. No other fruit fly will mate with them. These are not promising avenues for macroevolution. They're in fact dead ends for evolution because these mutations cannot be passed on by ordinary reproduction. It's almost as if the fruit fly says, if you want me to exist at all, I better have two eyes, six legs, two wings, and so on. I better have more or less the normal form. Modern Darwinists contend that there are some cases where mutations do promote evolution. Their chief example could be considered another icon of evolution, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Antibiotic resistance, in terms of natural selection, is an excellent example in its use. I mean, it's one of the, one of the um, hallmark examples given in, in microevolution for support of Darwinian thought. However, I think in the, in the last few years, it's got to be reinterpreted to a degree. Laboratory research shows that when an antibiotic is applied to literally billions of bacteria cells in a petri dish, a few mutated cells that happen to be resistant to that drug remain. Those few cells can then give rise to a colony of resistant bacteria. The question is, how well does this mutant strain survive in the long run? This can be measured in what scientists call fitness cost. How well does this mutant bacteria survive when the drug is removed and it now must compete with the original parent bacteria? These organisms are not able to grow with the fidelity, the robustness that the original parent did. And that's one of the things that we've been looking at. So you can take a culture of cells that are, that are sensitive to the drug, play them out on petri dishes that have the drug, but there's a single colony coming up that's resistant to the drug. One cell that gave rise to this colony was resistant to the drug out of four billion. If this is the parental strain, we now have a mutant, we grow them up separately, and then we put them in the same test tube without the drug. So now we've removed selection. 
and we can measure empirically the fitness cost in terms of how well the resistant organism can now compete with its parent. The surprising result is that in a relatively short period of time, the resistant bacteria lose out in their competition with the parent. They can't reproduce as fast and over a short time disappear. Within one or two transfers of overnights, you can lose that population of resistant cells. And then after the third transfer, the resistant isolate has been completely outcompeted by the parent. It turns out that the resistance string has a defect in its information processing system. The cell's crippled and there's a limit to how much change can occur. When the resistance string comes into contact with a parental wild type in nature, the parental wild type will reestablish dominance in the population, resulting in no net evolutionary change. We're going backwards in terms of the fitness of these organisms, not forwards, is used as an example of evolution. According to critics of Darwin's theory, finch beaks, four-weaned fruit flies, and drug-resistant bacteria all raise problems for the neo-Darwinian claim that random mutations and natural selection drive the development of life. But there's another part of Darwin's theory that is also being challenged by some scientists. That's the claim that all living things are ultimately descended from a common ancestor. This claim underlies perhaps the biggest icon of evolution of all, the tree of life. The classical Darwinian picture of the history of life is that of a tree, that these small incremental changes build up and they branch out and so you start from very simple life and eventually you get everything that we have around us, from elephants to alligators to chimpanzees and, and everything in between. Critics say that evidence used to support Darwin's tree of life is just as questionable as evidence used for the other icons of evolution. One major piece of evidence used to support the tree of life is homology. There is the front flipper, a hand built on the same model as my own hand. Biologists define homology as similarity in structure between different organisms. Now this has the same design exactly as your arm. There's the upper My arm, textbook one would show the forelimb, a hand, and it would show a bat's wing and a whale's flipper and say because they have similar structure, have similar bone pattern, that they must share a common ancestor. And then the five very long fingers, just like yours. The mere pattern of the bones doesn't tell you how it happened. You have to supply a mechanism to explain how it got that way. Well, Darwin's mechanism, as understood by modern Darwinists, was genetic. You inherited similar genes, and these genes made the bones grow the way they do. The problem is that the evidence doesn't fit that explanation. According to modern Darwinism, if two structures are similar because of common ancestry, each structure should be produced by similar genes and go through a similar pattern of development in the embryo. But contrary to these predictions, biologists are learning that homologous structures can be produced by different genes and follow different patterns of development. For example, biologists consider the body segments of fruit flies and wasps as homologous. Darwinism predicts that these similarities should be due to the same gene. But in fact, different genes account for the development of body segments in these insects. This contradicts the idea that homology must point to common ancestry. In the same way, many body structures considered homologous by biologists develop in embryos in fundamentally different ways. One example is the gut in vertebrates. If the Darwinian theory were correct, the process by which the gut is constructed should itself be homologous. In fact, this isn't the case. We know, for instance, that in different vertebrates, the gut is constructed in very different ways during development. In sharks, the gut develops from cells in the roof of the embryonic cavity. In lampreys, the gut develops from cells on the floor of the embryonic cavity. And in frogs, the gut develops from cells in both the roof and the floor. So you have a homologous structure in vertebrates that is built in one way in a shark 
in one way in a lamprey, in another way in frogs, and you've got these very different developmental pathways converging to the same structure. This is very hard to reconcile with Darwinian common descent. These marine reptiles were built on much the same plan as you are. I would say in the past 20 years of studying this problem that biology is now entering what can only be described as a revolution because the evidence is so overwhelmingly against the conventional neo-Darwinian view. Now, what about those other reptiles that flew in the air? If homology doesn't provide evidence for the tree of life, what does? A second proof usually offered is the fossil record. According to most biology textbooks, fossils show the gradual development of life from simple to complex over hundreds of millions of years. But a growing number of scientists say that this textbook story is incomplete and even misleading because it ignores an extraordinary event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian explosion is a term that refers to the geologically sudden appearance of all the major or most of the major groups of animals uh, at about the same time, geologically speaking. Most geologists date the Cambrian explosion at 530 to 520 million years ago. The Cambrian explosion is uh, a name given to a geologic event, really, the appearance in the fossil record over a period of about 10 million years or slightly less of a skeletonized fauna that includes uh, many living phyla for the first time. Animals with similar body plans are grouped together to form various phyla. Indeed, if you look at the tree of life, you can infer that nearly or all living phyla had evolved by the end of the explosion period. The Cambrian explosion has been called life's big bang, or at least animal's big bang, because uh, in the Cambrian explosion, most of the major forms of animals appear very suddenly in a geological sense. From nothing, we have almost everything, almost overnight, geologically speaking. This remains mysterious. Nobody really understands how this happened. The explosion is real in the sense that the fossils are real. There they are. Explaining it, however, is, is controversial. We're not sure. Uh, just how far back animals originated before the explosion or what the events were that led up to it. In Darwin's theory, if you think of the branching tree, Darwin's branching tree, the common ancestor down here and the different modern forms of animals up here, you would have one form to begin with and then it would gradually diverge into slightly different forms and more and more different until you get the major differences that we see now. The problem with the Cambrian explosion is that all these major differences appear together at the same time with no fossil evidence that they descended from this common ancestor. You have a sudden emergence of new biological form and structure and the suddenness of it defies the Darwinian mechanism's ability to produce new structure. Darwin believed that his mechanism must act slowly through small, gradual, incremental changes. And as a result, he expected to find many transitional, intermediate forms from the very simplest organisms to the first animals. Darwin knew about the Cambrian fossil record and he considered, considered it a, a serious problem for his theory. He hoped that future fossil collecting would fill in the gaps somewhat and uh, make the theory more plausible. But in fact, 150 years of continued fossil collecting have made the problem worse. Many more types of animals were involved than Darwin knew about. So it's actually more of an explosion now than Darwin thought it was. 
Most biology textbooks, however, supply little information about the Cambrian explosion, if they even mention it at all. My textbook gives a one-sentence statement, just that there was this Cambrian explosion of life. But then it goes on to give a traditional Darwinian theory as to this slow, gradual, evolving process. DeHart wanted to supplement the solitary sentence in the biology textbook with an article that appeared in the Boston Globe. The article reported on cutting-edge research by Chinese scientist J.Y. Chen, an internationally respected paleontologist at the Nanjing Institute of Paleontology and Geology. Chen's discoveries in the fossil beds in Xinjiang, China, have rocked the scientific establishment. Located in the province of Yunnan in southern China, Xinjiang has some of the world's best preserved fossils from the Cambrian era. Darwinism helps them maybe only telling a part story for evolution. According to Chen, the fossils he's discovered turn Darwin's tree of life upside down. Darwin's tree, you know, uh, reverse courtship, very unexpectedly, our research convincing uh, major phylos starting down below at the beginning of Cambria. Base is white gradually narrow, so this is almost uh, turned on a different way. I do not believe that animals developed gradually from the bottom up. I think the animals suddenly appeared. Among the Qingjiang animals, we have found 136 different kinds of animals, and they represent diversity in the level of phyla and classes. So the sudden appearance makes them very special. One view that many paleontologists hold is that though the phyla appeared suddenly during the Cambrian explosion, there must have been a long period of evolutionary development before that event. Some people believe that uh, it was a very rapid origin of these body plans. Other people believe that it was a long, gradual buildup to it, which I, which I think is probably right. But there must have been a prehistory in which we started at the bottom and worked up to the phyla. If there was a long history of evolution prior to the Cambrian explosion, there should be an abundance of transitional fossils. Or perhaps those animals were too small or soft-bodied to be preserved. The Darwinists have known since the 19th century that the Cambrian explosion did not conform to the picture of life that Darwin proposed. But one of their explanations for that was something called the artifact hypothesis, the idea that we were simply not sampling the fossil record sufficiently to find the missing transitional intermediates. In the strata just beneath the Cambrian fossil beds, we have a very favorable environment that would have preserved uh, ancestral forms of these animals had they existed. So one of the versions of the artifact hypothesis was the claim that we don't find these missing Precambrian animals because they were too small and they were soft-bodied. And what we now find in the Chinese fossils, in the beds just beneath the Cambrian explosion, are perfectly preserved soft-bodied tissues, sponge embryos, that are, of course, soft and microscopic. The new finds in the Chengjiang formations really completely put to rest the artifact hypothesis. If you can preserve an embryo, you can preserve an animal. And if those animals were there, then we should have found them. And they're not there. Some defenders of Darwin's theory argue that random mutations in a special set of genes called Hox genes are responsible for dramatically speeding up the evolutionary process during the Cambrian period. But what's interesting to me is that these genes are turned on late in development, long after the body plan is established. A fruit fly is already a fruit fly embryo before the Hox genes kick in. The same for a human, or a worm, or a starfish. So without a mechanism for sudden mutation, or a record of transitional fossils, Critics say Darwin's theory lacks the evidence it needs to account for the remarkable Cambrian explosion.
While scientists in China are being allowed to raise tough questions about Darwin, back in Burlington, Roger DeHart's request to show students the article about the Chinese fossils is refused. But he's in for an even greater disappointment. After 15 years of teaching biology in his district, DeHart is informed during the summer that he has been reassigned. His biology courses will be taught by someone just out of college who majored in physical education, not biology like DeHart. Certainly we knew that there would be people that would be concerned, people that would think we were trying to do something to Roger. But that's not why we make decisions around here. Regardless of the reasons for DeHart's reassignment, the question still needs to be asked. Does a high school teacher have the right to present information critical of an accepted scientific theory? And just how should public schools handle a controversial issue like evolution? A very popular uh, American tradition is the fairness or let's let all sides have their say and so forth. This is a wonderful cultural tradition. It's irrelevant in science. It sounds really unfair, but it isn't the job of the high school teacher to decide uh, that students need to be exposed to views that are on the fringe of science. I mean, the job of the high school teacher is to try to communicate the consensus view of science. Otherwise, you're really misleading those kids. But what happens if scientists have different views? Who is to say whose views should be heard? School districts face jeopardy if they allow the science classroom to be used as a means of religious indoctrination. Uh, but they also face jeopardy if they engage in viewpoint discrimination. The Supreme Court has been very clear that school boards have no right to remove offending viewpoints simply because they disagree with them. Even if some scientists challenge evolution, are high school teachers and their students equipped to hear about such disagreements? The role of a high school teacher is not to be on the cutting edge of research, and it's not doing the students any service to confuse them about some of the esoteric uh, elements of a scientific discipline. I find the fact that they think that freshmen aren't capable of looking at facts and looking where they lead very insulting. I'm a little insulted if someone says that, you know, having more than one side to a theory is going to be too complex for a high school mind. This is Biology 101. I mean, they have kids' books on the topic. If they think that we cannot handle or we are not capable of understanding the complexities of the argument, we shouldn't be in high school. My experience is students will rise to the occasion, and the more controversial, the more interested they'll become. Often controversy is the way to get students involved in any discipline. The idea that the high school has to be um, a, a kind of enlarged locker room where only the coach's pep talk is considered reasonable, that should be repugnant. That's not really how we want an educational establishment to, to be run, is it? Um, Let's give high school students the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that they're a whole lot more intelligent, presentable, better dressed, better groomed, smarter, more sophisticated than they give every appearance of being. Right now, they're treated to a dogma, and when they know it's a dogma, they lose interest. So real education will take place when uh, students are allowed to know there's a controversy in science. The debate over how to teach evolution is likely to get more intense. As part of a landmark education law passed in 2001, Congress mandated that each state develop uniform standards for teaching science. Defenders of Darwin's theory want these standards to discourage any discussion of alternate viewpoints about evolution. But Congress encouraged states to adopt a more inclusive approach, urging that where topics are taught that may generate controversy, such as biological evolution, the curriculum should help students to understand the full range of scientific views that exist, why such topics may generate controversy, and how scientific discoveries can profoundly affect society. Congressional support for teaching both sides of the evolution debate has been bipartisan and spanned the political spectrum. So I think there are many benefits to this discussion that, that we hope to encourage in science classrooms across this country. Uh, and I frankly don't see any downside. 
uh, to this discussion, uh, that we are standing here as the Senate in favor of intellectual freedom and open and, and fair discussion. Uh, we want the children to be able to talk uh, and speak and uh, e examine uh, various um, scientific uh, theories with the basis of all of the information that is available uh, to them. There are increasing signs that the public agrees that teachers should be able to present more than one view about evolution. According to a recent Zogby poll, 71% of Americans agree that biology teachers should teach Darwin's theory of evolution, but also the scientific evidence against it. Only 15% of the public think that biology teachers should teach only Darwin's theory and the scientific evidence that supports it. And in the scientific community, growing numbers of scholars are expressing doubts about Darwin's theory and calling for an open hearing for their views. More than a hundred scientists, including scholars from Yale, Princeton, MIT, and the Smithsonian, signed on to a statement declaring that they were skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. The declaration ran as an ad in the prestigious New York Review of Books. Some school districts are allowing teachers more freedom to discuss the controversy over evolution. High school biology teacher Doug Cowan has been supplementing the approved curriculum for years. I start my uh, unit on evolution with uh, a statement that says we're going to teach evolution as science. Uh, we're going to show not only the confirming evidence and uh, the support that it has in a very forceful way, but we're also going to show some of the anomalies of evolutionary theory that uh, are bringing many scientists uh, to doubt whether Darwin had it right in the beginning. There's a false belief out there that it's somehow unconstitutional or against the First Amendment to allow a teacher to criticize Darwin's theory in the classroom. And that's just absolutely false. Teaching the controversy is really striving for fairness and uh, mutual respect when we approach a controversial issue. I think a school board that does that has the least likelihood of offending either the legal requirements or the political community in which they operate. The call for greater openness comes too late for Roger DeHart. No longer allowed to teach biology in the Burlington School District, DeHart resigns his position and takes a job in another district. I've always considered myself as being a science teacher and, and wanting to teach accurate science. I don't have uh, a desire to be subversive just to be subversive. I see my job as being a science educator and uh, showing students this search for truth and what researchers have actually found. The Scopes trial stereotype is really now exactly 180 degrees out of sync. The image of the bold, free-thinking, evolutionary scientist who was trying to seek the truth, no holds barred, and he was being suppressed by religionists who were threatened by the truth of science. Now I think we have almost exactly the reverse situation. The people who are really suffering are the students. They're the ones that are not learning the truth about uh, the science and how it's developing. Uh, they're being held back. We are not serving our students well by not allowing them to hear different points of view. We're not training them to be good scientists. Scientists are supposed to question things. Scientists are supposed to be open to new evidence. I think the best thing I can do as a science educator is to get students to critically think. To be able to uh, look at evidences given and to be able to interpret those evidences. Uh, to ask questions and to make observations. So teach it more and teach it critically. You know, this is the exceptional area that you can't criticize this doctrine of Darwinism. Um, it's a bad precedent. What's the loss? What do we risk? Just what do we risk if some of the, um, the profound, exciting, deeply perplexing, uh, vexing issues of biology are presented honestly? Should we teach students the controversy about evolution? Absolutely. This is a controversial theory. Are we going to teach students the truth about it or not?